Whether you're out for a relaxing day sail or racing to Bermuda, priority number one is crew safety. With that thought in mind, let's take a close look at gear devised to maximize your security on board your vessel. For the Storm Trisail Foundation, I'm Gary Jobson. Captain Henry Marks of Landfall Navigation has enjoyed a distinguished career on the water. We spoke with Captain Marks about which safety gear improves her chances for a safe and successful voyage offshore. Henry, very important to wear a personal flotation device or at least have one out there on the water. What do you prefer? Absolutely have to wear a life jacket when you're out on the water. Something like 90% something like of the people that drown weren't wearing life jackets. My favorite jacket, and this is my personal jacket, is the Mustang uh, hydrostatic uh, release with a harness in it. And I wear this anytime I'm on the water. Uh, it, it's comfortable and it's, uh, it works. Does now, it get in the way? No, it, it's, it's very compact and it does not get in the way. As an alternative, you can have the Type 1 Solus jacket. This is a 35 pound flotation, the same flotation as my Mustang. Um, but think about trying to get down the companionway hatch with this on. The next thing which you got with your, um, with your Coast Guard package, probably for your boat, is a Type 2. This has 15 pounds of flotation and probably will turn your face up in the water, but not, um, not necessarily. The Type 3, which is the most common jacket that most um, small boat sailors wear, uh, wear, has 13 to 15 pounds of flotation. And the one downside of this is that if you're unconscious, within a minute you will probably be facing floating face down, which may not work out so well. But you have to wear a life jacket if you're going to go out on the water, even if, you can, even if you're a good swimmer. So you're an advocate that anytime you're in the water, you should have a personal flotation device and ideally, you'll have an inflatable. Yes. Now, tell me about the different ways that these inflate. Take the Mustang. Okay. This Mustang, um, the hydrostatic release, as I said, uses an inflator that looks like this. And this inflator will not go off if it gets wet. You can play a garden hose on this all day. But if you, um, if you put it three inches under water, your jacket's inflated. The good news is you only have to replace this every five years, unlike the other units, which have to be checked. Are they, are they reliable? Very reliable. I've never heard of somebody having one not go off if they properly maintained it. So your Mustang uh, harness there, your PFD, uh, what, what are some of the elements that are involved Well, here? this is my personal one. What I have on here is I have a number of devices. I have a fanny pack on this side which is very handy. At nighttime, I keep a flashlight in it. Um, I keep a, uh, my tether when I'm not tethered in. And um, you can even put a handheld flare in there if you really want to uh, be, be fully safe. Just remember to take it out before you check your, your life jacket on the airline. On the other side, I have two devices. I have a spray hood. And what this spray hood does is when I inflate the vest, I pull this spray hood out of the pouch over my head and it does a number of things. This red is a lot more visible from a distance than my white hair. And this plastic shield keeps the uh, cold water out of my face. The other thing is that this hood is a hypothermia barrier. And you lose something like 70 or 80 percent of your body heat out of the top of your head when you're in the water, which lengthens the time you can be there without being hypothermic. The other thing I have on my vest is an AIS transponder. And what this does is when I go in the water, I open, turn it on hold it up, and um, any AIS enhanced vessel within VHF range, which is line of sight, will have me on their chart plotter with a distress signal on the chart plotter, enabling them to find me and come pick me up out of the water. Remember, when you go overboard, it's getting you out of the water that counts, not necessarily which boat gets you out of the water. And does that float? Uh, no, this does not float. So, Henry, there's a lot of things that you're telling us that you have to understand how to use the spray hood, how to get the AIS, uh, all these things. Should somebody go practice Absolutely. In, in advance, get in a swimming pool, or how, how do you do this? Absolutely. When you buy a new inflatable PFD, I strongly recommend that you jump in a swimming pool or jump off the boat if the water is warm, tied to the dock, and see what happens. Because when this inflates, it's a very new, re new experience. It's not what you expect, and it can be very startling. And if you fall overboard, you're already disoriented and scared. 
So all these elements you should practice a couple times so you know how to handle the equipment when you're in the water. It's not a bad idea at the beginning of the season as you get your crew together and you have a man overboard drill which includes everybody going over the side in their life jacket. If nothing else, you've just tested the life jackets and, uh, and, and practice so that when it does happen, everybody knows what to expect. So there's different types. Yes. Let's just walk through them one at a time. Okay. Hydrostatic. Hydrostatic. What does it, that mean and how it does it work? It means it's pressure activated. It's not water activated. So when you, get, when you fall in the water and you go down, you go down about three to four inches, the hydrostatic pressure of the, of the water uh, fires the CO2 and inflates your jacket. So you don't have to think. Don't, it's all automatic. You don't do anything. You can be unconscious when you hit the water and you'll wake up on your back looking at the stars. Automatic. Automatic. Um, in the old days, people, a lot of four-deck hands did not like automatics because they, if they um, got, got a wave over them, they, they could conceivably inflate when they didn't want them to. But this hydrostatic prevents all of that. All righty. And how about the manual? How does that work? Manual works by, uh, well, they, every, the manual works by, you, you, to inflate this, all you have to do is you take this yellow tab and you give it a yank and the light jacket inflates. All the jackets, including the hydrostatic, have a manual activator, so you can inflate it at your desire. Um, the manual, there's, there's, between the manual and the hydrostatic, there's the old-style automatic, we call it. This one has a bobbin in it, which is a little yellow pill. And when you screw this uh, down in the activator and put the new CO2 cartridge in, it sits just like this. As soon as this gets wet, you're inflated. Now, when you wash your gear off at the end of the race, don't do what a friend of mine did, and he threw his foul weather gear in his life jacket in the shower, turned the shower on, and guess what? One inflated life jacket. I liked it. Well, go ahead. Well, that's good business. Yes. So, how do you rearm these? To rearm these is, is, is fairly simple. With the, um, I'll, I'll show you the automatic. To, to rearm this automatic unit, which is probably the most complicated one, you open the jacket up, and you reach in to this pouch and you pull the mechanism out. Now ever since the Coast Guard approved these, they've required an indicator to see whether this, vest, this jacket is armed. Now you undo the CO2 card, just about a half turn, and I take it off. And when I did that, you'll notice that the window goes from green to red. The other part of this is the bobbin and I unscrew this tower which is merely a spring with a firing pin in it and there is the bobbin and you just replace the bobbin here and just be sure when you screw it down that you screw it down tight. So how often do you rearm? Well anytime you use the jacket you have to rearm it because they only work once. These bobbins should be changed once a year because they will absorb moisture while they're on the boat and when they get wet enough they go off on their own and you'll come down to the boat some Friday night and find that the uh, jacket's inflated. Now to put this back in I take it and line it up with the grooves and push it in down and then turn it like that and now it's all set to go. And this jacket also comes with a, um, a whistle which is important. Remember the importance of the whistle is that if you have water in your lungs you can still blow a whistle, but you can't yell. The other thing is you don't want a whistle with a cork ball in it because when they get wet, they don't whistle. This is a, a whistle that has no balls in it, and it uh, whistles whether it's wet or otherwise. <whistles> the other thing that I like about these Mustangs, seeing as you're talking about rearming them, is that to rearm this To rearm this jacket, this is the oral inflation tube. If you want to test your <coughs> unit, you can blow this up hard orally and let it set overnight. And if it's hard in the morning, you're okay. And then you just, there's a check valve, you just let the air out. But to rearm this kit, this jacket, you hold the valve down and squeeze all the air out of it. Then you merely lay it down like this, fold it over, and you're inflated. I'm sorry, you're, uh, you're rearmed. Ready to go. How many should I carry on my boat? I recommend that people, I always carry one 
rearm kit with me at all times. You're allowed by TSA one life jacket and one uh, rearm kit in your check luggage. So thigh straps, the purpose of the thigh strap is what? The purpose of the thigh strap is to pull the vest down so it doesn't ride up on you when you're in the water because remember the vest is going to float and you're going to sink and the thigh strap protect, presents that. It also um, keeps you more vertical in the water which is a better position to be in from waves in your face, etc. Uh, they're required by ISAF uh, for most of your major races in the ORC in Europe. I don't believe you can race without them. Another uh, option for thigh straps or crotch straps are the Mustang aftermarket straps. These are made by Mustang and they're, you can put these on any inflatable life vest and thereby put your jacket in compliance but also benefit from the advantage of having thigh straps on your life jacket. Okay. How do you know which is right for a sailboat, a power boat? Tell me, is there, is there one that better for sail versus power? Well, uh, a lot of the offshore racing sailors prefer the spin lock vest because it's a complete package. You have a spray hood in here, you have a light in here, you have the thigh straps it comes with, and um, it's, uh, it's a very substantial vest. The one drawback to the spin lock is it's not Coast Guard approved. How much are these? The, uh, they run anywhere from about, a, an automatic unit with, with, a, with, with a harness runs anywhere from about $200 to about $350. Power boaters normally, you don't need the safety harness, which are these big, big rings. They add about $40, $50 to the cost of the vest. They add weight to the vest, and you just don't need them because most power boaters are either in a cockpit or a cabin, and they don't run around on the foredeck changing sail. They also, with the inflatables, we have uh, a, a new line of Mustangs coming out that are 28 pounds of flotation. Remember, these all the ones are 35, and that's for the inshore sailor. They're a little lighter, they're a little more compact, and they're a little bit less expensive. And for inshore, where you're going to be in the water for 15 or 20 minutes in relatively calm water, they're perfectly adequate. Does one size fit all? Mustang does make an expansion strap, much like the expansion strap you can get on the airlines for the over plus people, which will expand this, but um, I've never had a problem putting an, an inflatable life jacket on somebody, and I think of the boat show, I put on, one on somebody over 300 pounds. How about a pet, petite woman? Well, the Coast Guard regulations for the Coast Guard approved units like the Mustang is you have to be 16 years of age and weigh 90 pounds to legally wear a Mustang if you want to be Coast Guard approved. Petite women have, a, um, have an issue it can only be addressed by putting the jacket on, cinching it up, and seeing if it, uh, if it fits or not. So how do you adjust these so they fit snugly? The, um, all these jackets have, have buckles in the back where you can take the, the belt, the, the, the horizontal belt, and, and tighten it up. There are no adjustments on the, on the vertical, but there are adjustments on the, on the side. And I tell people to adjust these, snap the jacket together, and pull it comfortably tight. Remember when this jacket inflates, it's gonna get a lot tighter on you than it was. But you don't want it sloppy so that you'll slide out of it. Tell me a little bit about the spray hood. The advantage of the spray hood is hyperthermia prevention and visibility. When you put this on, it, um, Oh, you put it on with the clear in front. Yes. You put it on, and what you have is the orange up here, which is very visible. You have the plastic in front of you so that it keeps the cold water out of your face. And, th and this, again, is the uh, hypothermia barrier. And it comes in a little pouch like this that you fasten on your webbing. I use two uh, wire ties to put, my, put it on, and it works very well. Why do the straps on the bottom of that? Uh, they, these straps pull over the inflated... Uh, bulb at the bottom of the life jacket. Another important thing on your life jacket, probably more important than the spray hood, are lights. You have to have a light on your, on your life jacket because you're not going to be seen if you don't. The incandescent uh, lights are cheaper and we do not recommend them. You want a strobe light because a strobe light is visible even in the daytime. This is one that's made specifically for inflatable vests. It's the ACR Firefly, 
and this loop hooks over the oral inflation tube on the, on the life jacket and, and folds right into the jacket. I've always been a fan of the, of the ACR <clears throat> Firefly series. They make three. But the problem with this one is you have to tie a piece of flag halyard on this and then tie it on your belt, wrap it around, and stuff it in when you fold, it, fold the jacket over, and it's much bulkier and, and harder to use. But you need to have a light. Without a light, we can't find you. How long does that light last? Well, water temperature and, and, and battery age is important, of course, always. But I think they're good for 16 to 20 hours. Oh, it's a long time. It's all night long. Yeah. A mirror is never a bad thing to carry. You need, uh, because it, at nighttime you can reflect any spotlights that are being shown towards you. In the daytime you have the sunlight. And if you flash a, a, a mirror at somebody long enough, you'll annoy them enough to come over and pick you up. And that's got a whistle on it? This, this has a whistle tied to it. And what's that yellow device there? That's a float. Before I describe the AIS transponder that was on my own personal life vest, and this does not signal the Coast Guard, but it sends a message to every vessel within visual range that I'm in the water where I am. And if you have a, that means any boat can come back and get me. And if there's a tugboat pushing an oil barge, he can, um, hopefully go around you instead of uh, running over you. The alternative to that is a personal EPIRB, PLB. This does not notify the boat in, or any of the boats in the neighborhood, but what this does is calls the Coast Guard Search and Rescue Station and alerts them that you are in the water. This unit is registered to you and um, <clears throat> they know who it is and they come get you. Now, the problem that I don't like about this is that the boat has nothing to receive this information, but if you call the Coast Guard, tell them you lost somebody overboard and where you are, their search and rescue center should by then be able to tell you the latitude and longitude of the, of the PLB in the water, put it into your chart plotter as a waypoint, and go pick them up. So call the, you've got to have a cell phone that's in range, you've got to have a sat phone, you've got to... VHF radio or a single sideband. What, what, depending what, Coast-wise, all you need is a VHF radio or even maybe a cell phone. Uh, offshore, you need a sat phone. Would you carry both of those devices with you? I'm a coastal sailor these days, so all I carry is the AIS. The way somebody described it to me is this is coastal, this is offshore. The AIS is, is coastal, the, the PLB is offshore. How do you maintain one of these? I, you showed me a little earlier about how you inflate it earlier to uh, maintain it. In the spring or whenever you do your major maintenance on your boat, you should maintain your uh, life jackets. And what you do is you take the jacket, <clears throat> you can pull the handle and inflate it with your CO2 cartridge and that makes landfall uh, $15 richer. Or you can do it the right way with the oral inflation tube. You open it up, take your oral inflation tube and merely blow it up so it's hard. Leave it set overnight on a kitchen counter on a couch or whatever. Come down in the morning. If it's not hard, there's a problem with this life vest and you should take it back where you got it and have it serviced or replaced because if it won't hold air overnight, it won't hold you up very long in the water. And then when you're done, you depress the uh, check valve in this and squeeze the air out. It's important to always keep your gear clean and after you're covered with salt, you should wash off your life jackets and all the rest of your gear when you're done sailing for the day or off watch. And the best way to do that is with fresh water and uh, with the hydrostatics and with the manual activated only jackets, you just turn the hose on them and let it go. With the automatics, with the bobbin, what you do is you hold them up like this and lightly sp sprinkle them off because the water will run down like this and fall off. It won't go back up into the inflator, but you have to hold them up so the water drains. Is there a time where you would favor wearing kind of a dinghy vest? I'm told by my friends who, who I'm told by my friends who sail dinghies, you know, even up to Vipers, that these are, are less, believe it or not, less bulky because they're fairly compact. And in a small cockpit of a dinghy where you're not running around the deck, they're comfortable. And the other thing is, you have a chase boat close by, so the concept of being knocked on cold, knocked unconscious, and 
on drowning is probably not going to happen because somebody will get to you before you drown. Other than that, no. The Dan Buoy is a relatively new man overboard device that we've had for about a year and a half. And what this is, is it's a man overboard pole. It's a big yellow pole that's about this big around. And when you, you merely take this bag when somebody falls overboard and throw it into the water. When it hits the water, it's got an automatic activator in it and it inflates. You want to inflate it? Um, it inflates. Like this. And floats like me. this. You're right. yeah, and right. enables you to find the person in the water, because if anybody's more than about 25 yards away from the boat, it's very difficult to find a, a head floating in the water. It has a drogue, and it has a pennant that waves in the breeze. And this is, remember, it's gonna be floating about here because of the lead bag in the bottom. That what happens is you put your arms through here and you just hold on to this until you uh, get rescued, and there is some flotation in it. Because the water activated light, that's not a strobe light. So what's the cool thing about this stand buoy? Well, one big advantage of this to the sailor is that to repack this, you bleed the air out of it just like the life jacket, and you put a 25, use a $25 rearm kit, which is a CO2 cartridge and a bobbin, and you're rearmed. If you use the, some of the other devices, like the man overboard mod, you'd have to send that out to a life raft repacker, and it costs you over $100. How much is this thing? $395 versus $1,200 bucks for a month. And you just keep it on the stern of your boat? You keep, well, <clears throat> you can't leave this bag like it was in the rain because it's, it'll go off. But they now have, they now have a, bag, a rail mount bag. It's a, like a life sling bag that you mount on the rail that this bag goes in and you can leave it on the rail. Yeah, you just leave it on the rail. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the, what a mom is. This is a mom or a man overboard module. And what's in this box is a man overboard pole, very similar to the Dan buoy, and a horse, a inflatable horseshoe ring. What happens, the way this works is when you, um, <clears throat> when somebody goes overboard, this is mounted outboard on your stern pulpit. And when somebody goes overboard, what you do is you pull this pin. And when you pull this pin, package drops overboard and if this was not was a was a live one the uh, it would have inflated just like the uh, Dan Bowie did and you have you have here a horseshoe a drogue again and this this is a man overboard pole again with the lead bag Okay, tell me about the Seattle Sailing Foundation Life Sling. The Life Sling is one of the best man overboard recovery devices invented in recent times. <clears throat> Remember, the, li the Life Sling is fastened to the boat, so when I fall overboard and you deploy the Life Sling, I'm on my own until you've made your circle to come back and pick me up. So it's not a life preserver, it's a recovery device. And what happens is the Life Sling is mounted on your railing. You can mount it inside or outside the rail, it doesn't matter. And you take this nylon line and you tie it to a backstay, stern, cleat, something substantial. Then, when somebody falls overboard, you merely pull the top out, pull the bag out, and throw it over the rail. This then is dragged around behind the boat, and you make a circle like you were recovering a water skier. When you get to the person, in the, when the person in the water gets to the life sling, stop the boat and have them get into it. Now you, the rescue's over. Now you can stop the boat and just pull them in. You can pull the line in by hand. You can put it on a winch. Just pull them up to the boat. The um, one thing to remember is don't tow people rapidly with a life sling. We discovered in San Francisco Bay that if you tow somebody over two knots in a life sling, the life sling sub submerges and this will upset your drowning victim. How long is the lanyard? Uh, the lanyard is 125 feet. There's 125 feet of line here. And as an accessory to the life sling, which I don't have here, is a block and tackle. And the block and tackle is used when you pull a person up to the boat, you pull them up and tie it off tight, take your main halyard, drop your main halyard down, or any other halyard, and hook it into the tack top of the tackle. Then the other end of the tackle goes in here, 
because if you have a five to one tackle, it's a lot easier for a small woman to pick a large man up out of the water and then you either run it through a fair lead to the winch and crank them up or just pull them up. The electric winches are all set. For a power boat, I recommend that they put a D-ring on the side of the radar arch and hook, hook the tackle onto that and then they can hoist them aboard the same way. Please remember, it's important that you have a personal flotation device for every person on the boat. In addition to the Coast Guard requirements, it's important to your, you and your friend's safety that they be safe because you can't swim with that forever.